These are the Golan Heights of northern Israel. Over my shoulder is the nation of Syria, and we are just under 40 miles from the capital city of Damascus. This brings to mind the road that a man named Saul of Tarsus once walked on during a mission to persecute believers. But our plan on the Bible from 30,000 feet brings us to another major personality of the Bible. Now, let's look over part of one of our flights in the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah contains 66 chapters that parallel the whole Bible. Isaiah uses the term salvation 26 times, a word found here more than in any other prophetic book. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles tonight to the book of Isaiah. And I want to begin with a little story that is somehow a bit humorous and a little bit convicting. There was a preacher years ago named Harry Ironside, and some of you have heard of, of, of him and read some of his commentaries. Well, he was meeting with a group of pastors one morning, and they were discussing what they did for their devotions that day. And so one pastor said, oh, I read Psalm, whatever it was. Another one said, I read Proverbs, whatever it was. And they came to Ironside, and they said, what did you read for your devotions this morning? He said, Isaiah. And they said, great, Isaiah chapter what? He goes, no, Isaiah the whole book, I read all 66 chapters to begin my day. Okay, well, like, you beat us all now. You're, like, the most spiritual ever. But that's, I mean, it's quite a chunk. Even to do it from the Bible from 30,000 feet is a daunting task. And we're only going to cover a portion of the book tonight, the first 39 chapters and 40 through 66 next week. We've finished the historical books of the Bible we have finished the poetical books of the Bible, and now we are into the prophets. And we come to the Shakespeare of all prophets, the prophet Isaiah. And this is a fascinating book. And because it's so vast, um, and I do hope that you have taken the time to at least read some of the key chapters, if not the whole book, in a week. I know that even seems like a lot for a week. But uh, we're just going to skim and cover some of the highlights so that you get the flow of the book and how it fits in the rest of the Bible. But back in 1971, there was um, a, a mission to the moon called the Apollo 14 mission. It was the third time they landed on the moon. And uh, one of the astronauts brought a Bible. The first time ever, a Bible was brought to space. It was a King James miniature Bible on microfilm, two inches by two inches square. It had been reduced 62,000 times its original size. But all 66 books of the Bible were placed in this tiny little package and brought to the moon. Some people believe that Isaiah is the literary version of that little analogy that I just gave you. That is, the whole Bible can be seen in one book, the book of Isaiah. There are 66 books in the Bible. How many chapters are there in Isaiah? 66 chapters. The Old Testament has 39 books. The New Testament has 27 books. That's interesting because Isaiah naturally breaks exactly the same way. The first 39 chapters have an emphasis. The last 27 chapters have an entirely different emphasis. So much so that some people believe two different authors wrote them. We'll get more into that later. The first 39 chapters, which we want to cover tonight, the main focus is condemnation. And then the last part of the book, the last 27 chapters, is about consolation. So from condemnation to consolation. So once again, the first 39 chapters are all denunciatory the last 27 are all conciliatory. The first 39 chapters, the emphasis is on government and law. This should start ringing some bells. And the last 27, the emphasis is upon love and upon grace. Also, here's another interesting fact in line with that illustration. Isaiah chapter 40, which is 
what we would say is the New Testament portion of the book of Isaiah, opens up with a description that is given to John the Baptist as you open up the Gospels. Comfort, yes, comfort my people. The voice of one crying in the wilderness makes straight the ways of the Lord. There's very many interesting parallels as we go through. Now, the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, is the most often quoted prophet of anyone else that is quoted in the New Testament. 21 different times Isaiah the prophet is mentioned and quoted in the New Testament. Jesus himself begins his ministry in Nazareth with a quote out of the book of Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's how he starts his ministry, by quoting the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is called the Messianic prophet because there is so much emphasis on the Messiah, on Jesus, because of chapters like chapter 7 of Isaiah, the Emmanuel prophecy, chapter 9, which speaks about the birth of Christ, uh, chapter 53, the atonement, etc. He's called the Messianic prophet because so much of his prophecy centers around Jesus. By the way, the name Isaiah means God's salvation or salvation of God. His Hebrew pronunciation would be Ishiau. So you can say that when you go home. Tonight we study the book of Ishiau, and that's the book of Isaiah. By the way, salvation will be mentioned 31 times in this book. This is the only book in the Bible to give Satan the name Lucifer, or bright one, light bearer, Lucifer. And it's one of two books in the Old Testament that describe the actual fall of Satan from times past. Now, I did mention that some people say that there are two authors. Let me just give you the rundown on this. There's a theory, and I bring it to your attention because some of you have heard of it, and you've questioned it called the Deutero-Isaiah Theory, that not one, but two authors wrote the book, that chapters 1 through 39 is one guy, and then a whole different guy, around 540 B.C., after the captivity, wrote chapters 40 through 66. That's one theory. There's even another theory that called the Trito-Isaiah Theory, that there are three different authors because of stylistic differences in the book. So chapters 1 through 39 is Isaiah 1 by one guy, Isaiah 2, or Deutero-Isaiah, is chapter 40 through 55, and then 56 through 66 is three Isaiah by three different people. And, yes, there are even more theories than that of several different authors adding to it. So who really did write this book of Isaiah? Glad you asked the question. That's a question I aim to answer next week as we finish out this book. We see, got to bring you back somehow. Isaiah the prophet ministered for 50 years. He had a good, long season of ministry through five kings of Judah, all which are mentioned in verse 1 of chapter 1. A little bit of tradition. We don't know if it's true, but according to the best tradition, the last king, Manasseh, that he was ministering during his reign... Tradition says that Manasseh took Isaiah the prophet and pushed him into a hollow log and had the log sawn in two. And that's how he died, as a martyr, sawn in two while he was alive until dead. He bled out in that log. Because Isaiah dared to point the finger at this idolatrous, wicked king and indict him and the nation with idolatry. Now, if that's the case... No doubt, this is what the writer of Hebrews had in mind when he writes in Hebrews 11, verse 37, they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, and they were slain with a sword. Last night, I was reading through a, a book. It was the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's a translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I thought, you know, I want to go through these again. It's been a while. And in studying about them and in reading some of the literature that comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls, it dawned on me that the greatest discovery, perhaps, 
was the 24-foot-long scroll of Isaiah the prophet that can be seen today in the shrine of the book in Jerusalem and is uh, taken out to different parts of the world on display in some museums. 24-foot-long, one solid, long scroll of Isaiah. Now, why was this find so important? Here's why. Get this. Up until 1947, when the scrolls were discovered, the earliest manuscript we had of Isaiah in the Old Testament dated from 895 A.D., A.D. But suddenly, in 1947, this little Bedouin kid throws a rock in a cave, hears a breaking jar, goes up, finds scrolls. It happens to be the book of Isaiah that had been written around 200 B.C. So suddenly, we have a book of the Bible that's 1,100 years older than the oldest manuscript that we have, the Ben Asher Codex from Cairo, Egypt. We have a book that's 1,100 years older than the oldest manuscript that we base our Old Testament on, the Masoretic text. But here's what is the best part of it. The Dead Sea Scrolls, the best part isn't what they found. It's what they didn't find. And what they didn't find is they compared this 1,100-year earlier manuscript with our, up to that date, earliest manuscript. They didn't find errors. They found no errors. They found 1,100 years of perfect scholarship and copying, 1,100 years removed. In fact, only nine letters in the entire book of Isaiah were different from one manuscript to another. Now, you could say, well, that testifies to the brilliance and the scholastic abilities and the determination and commitment of the scribes. Certainly it does, but also to the hand of God upon them year after year after year after year as those documents were copied down. Well, tonight we have time to only look at the, the first 39 chapters, which is a chunk, and we're going to fly over a lot of it, but after all, we're at 30,000 feet. So we want to look at condemnation. I'm going to give you a brief outline. You can write it down. Here's how this first part, chapters 1 through 39, breaks down. Number one, the condemnation of Judah. That's the southern kingdom. The condemnation of Judah. That's chapters 1 through 12. Number two, the condemnation of the other nations. That's chapters 13 through 23. Number three, the condemnation of Judah and Israel together woes and warnings, and that's chapters 28 through 35, and number four, the condemnation of Sennacherib. You're going, uh, please don't make me write that word down. Okay, write Assyria then, Assyria. That's the nation that that king was in charge of. The condemnation of Assyria or its king Sennacherib, and that's chapters 36 through 39. Now, if you just listen carefully to the outline I gave you, you're going, uh, wait a minute, you left some chapters out. You left out chapters 24, 25, 26, and 27. And you would have caught that if you were really listening well and writing that down. You can see that now in your notes. So you're saying, what, what happened there? Here's what happened. There's this little parenthesis that we call, here it is, Isaiah's little apocalypse. Isaiah's little apocalypse, where he takes a break and he speaks about a way future series of judgments and glory that we have not yet seen, but that is coming. That's his little apocalypse. So that's a brief outline of where we're going tonight. Oh, by the way, you should know this, and we'll see it in the next several weeks. There's a noticeable feature about prophecy. I don't want you to miss it. Otherwise, it'll be very confusing. Prophets, when they look to the future often saw things that would happen very shortly. Let's call that the immediate fulfillment to the prophecy. And they could see that what they're saying is going to happen very soon. But what they see is a template or a model or a grid that they could put up to the distant future because what happens here is going to happen again there in a greater scale. So you have a prediction of the abomination of desolation. And that's in the book of Daniel. 
And they can see that that's going to happen in the future, but that's going to be a template for a greater abomination of desolation that Jesus talks about that hasn't happened historically, but that will happen in the future. So prophets were like guys with bifocals. You know when you have bifocals? How many have bifocals? How many? Be honest, I do. I have a contact that goes there and one that goes here. And if, you, if I take them out and I have to wear these graduated lenses... I can focus on something up close, and then as I look up, the lens is adjust in the top of the glass so I can see in the distance. Prophecy sort of works like spiritual bifocals. You'll see something up close, but as you take what you're seeing and move it up into the horizon, it's a template for some greater fulfillment in the future. So, let's look at chapter 1 of Isaiah. In chapters 1 through 12, remember... It's the condemnation on the nation of Judah. Verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Thus begins a series of sermons by Isaiah denouncing, condemning Judah for its sins. Now, this prophet Isaiah did not just foretell the future. He was very socially active, this prophet. He was a reformer. We would call him a social reformer. So when he writes, it's not all foretelling the future. It's sometimes a foretelling of the failure of the people of Judah. Saying things like, wait a minute, who are you guys trusting anyway? Why are you making foreign alliances with Assyria or Syria or Egypt? You need to trust God instead of some army, the arm of the flesh. And a lot of his prophecy is about not trusting men, but trusting in the Lord. Okay. Isaiah's primary ministry, as stated in verse 1, is to the south, is to Judah is to Jerusalem. He's living in Jerusalem. He's walking the streets of Jerusalem. He's giving his messages to the Jerusalemites and the people of Judah. However, he will include Israel, and he will include other nations around the world, and eventually he'll include the earth, primary the south, Judah. Now, I'm going to refresh your memory. Most of you are now biblically astute and aware, and you know this because we've covered it. By the time he writes... The nation is divided. The nation is divided. There's not one united kingdom. There's not 12 tribes that love each other and one solid government. It's split in two. Jeroboam and Rehoboam, years earlier after Solomon, split the kingdom. Now there's 10 northern tribes we call the nation of Israel. Two southern tribes under the nation of Judah. Yet yeah, Judah and Benjamin, that's the south, in and around the environment of Jerusalem. Okay. Here's the background. Very important. 150 years before Isaiah was born, the kingdom of Assyria was already gaining strength and taking over the world slowly. And the northern kingdom, 150 years before Isaiah was born, was already trying to work deals with Assyria to pay them off so that they wouldn't attack Israel, the ten northern tribes. It didn't work. It backfired. By the time Isaiah the prophet had been born and was a young man, Assyria had already attacked the ten northern tribes and taken some of them captive. By the time Isaiah the prophet entered the ministry and became a prophet, the ten northern tribes had already fallen to Assyria in 722 B.C. And by the time he's ministering in Jerusalem... In the full swing of the book of Isaiah, the Assyrians are sweeping down into Judah, conquering 46 of their cities and marching against Jerusalem. That's the background of the book that happens during these five kings and their reign. So Assyria is this huge threat, and it's very important, especially in the first 39 chapters. Verse 2, you're saying, you're going to cover 39 chapters? Boy, no way. Watch. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. 
The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. Notice here's a guy who doesn't mind calling sin, sin, not a mistake, not a product of your environment, not a mishap. It's sin. It can be dealt with. You have a God who hates sin but who loves you, and there's a remedy. Verse 12. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons, your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. Now you might think, wait a minute. God, you're the very one who instituted these festivals, feasts, prayers, etc. It was your idea. It was your revelation. Yeah, but you know what? Here's the principle. God never separates the worship that you bring from the worshiper who brings it. He looks at the life, not just the act of worship, not just the smooth, golden-tongued prayer or preaching or feast or festival, but he looks at the heart and he notices there is a discrepancy. Verse 15, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. So here they are merrily going to church, we would say in a New Testament context, going to worship in the Old Testament context, going through the ritual of the feast and the sacrifices and the blood that is sacrificed and the prayers with the hands lifted up. Oh, we love you, Lord. All the while, all they're doing is rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic. That's all they're doing. Every week in their worship, they're just rearranging the decks on the deck of the chairs on the Titanic. It's going down. Their nation is going down. Eventually, it will be taken into Babylonian, not Assyrian captivity. And so he denounces them. But look at verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. They, though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So... The next several chapters are a series of these kinds of sermons. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this. So if you haven't, I want, I want you to notice it. If you have a modern translation, NIV, New King James, New American Standard, you notice that the structure so far of the book of Isaiah is poetic. It's poetic. It's, it's written in Hebrew parallelism, stanzas. Okay? Like the poetical books, the prophet writes and speaks in a very poetic fashion. Now that's important. Keep that in mind because when we get to a historical interlude later on, it goes from poetry to prose because he's telling a, a story. It's historic, not prophetic. And then when he switches back to the prophetic, it's the same kind of rendition on the page of your Bible. It's set out in stanzas and Hebrew parallelism. So there's a series of these sermons in the first 12 chapters where God denounces the sins of the leaders, the sins of the people. And I want you to look now at chapter 5 in one of these sermons, one of the most famous, and it's one of the sermons on the fruitless vineyard. Verse 1, now let me sing to my well-beloved the song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. That must be Mount Zion in Jerusalem. God gave every opportunity for the nation to bear fruit. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst. He made a wine press in it. He expected it to bring good fruit or good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. 
In the rest of the chapter, chapter 5, the sins are listed that he's asking them to judge. Look, judge for yourselves. And he lists immorality, drunkenness, materialism, etc. Just to paint a black picture until we get to chapter 6. Here comes the change because God is sending Isaiah, at this time a young man, as the prophet to make a difference. This is his calling. Now when God calls him, he gives him a vision. And people today need a real vision of God through the word of God. Why are we studying the Bible? To get nothing less than a pure, holy, true vision of God. Because nothing will prepare us for service than seeing who God really is. Verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, that's 739 B.C., by the way, after 52 good years of reign as a king. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. So this is very interesting. There's no king on the throne. The people are panicking. Isaiah's really bummed out. Because Uzziah was great and he brought spiritual reform and he was a spiritual catalyst. And so he must be thinking, there's no king on the throne. We're doomed. And God wants Isaiah to know that there might not be a king on the throne, but it really doesn't matter who's in office politically. Let me tell you who's on the throne ultimately, and that is God. And that's good to remember in an election year. Because some of you are going to vote, and I hope all of you vote, but some of you are going to vote, and after, after the election, you're going to be bummed out. Some of you will, because not all of you are probably going to vote the same. And I'm not going to tell you exactly who to vote for. But what I want you to know is no matter who gets elected, God is on the throne. So if you're tempted to think, oh no, we're doomed, my candidate didn't get in, boy, are you needing this vision. You need the big picture. It's not all about us. It's not all about America. In fact, one of the most disturbing things to me is the absence of America in prophetic literature. That's another Bible study. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face so he wouldn't look directly at God. With two he covered his feet to acknowledge his loneliness. With two he flew. That's service. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Theologians call this the trihegion, the thrice holy God. Could it imply the Trinity? Perhaps. It certainly emphasizes the character that God is holy. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And so if you think our PA system is loud, you, you wouldn't like heaven in this vision because it, was, it shook the posts. The house was filled with smoke. So God had his own smoke machine. That was quite a show. So I said, I said, woe is me. For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim, means burning ones, this angelic being, flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. The altar is where sacrifices were made, where sin was dealt with. And he touched my mouth with it. Ouch! No fun. I didn't bank on this in my worship service. I come to worship and I get a coal in my mouth. It's burning. Why? Because he said, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. So God deals with the very area where Isaiah needs to be worked on, cleansed, repented of. Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is purged. Special cleansing is needed before special service can begin. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Interesting to unravel that. And then I said, Here I am. Send him. No, no, no. That's what some of us say today. <laughs> who will go? Lord, I'm right over here and I'm praying for that guy. <laughs> and, and he's going to go and I'm going to support that guy. It's another thing to go, I'll be the guy. Here I am, Lord, send me. So he begins his ministry. Now, chapter 7, 
and chapter 9 are some of the most beautiful prophecies of the coming Messiah. Emmanuel, a son is born, a son is given. They predict Messiah's birth and reign. And know that these prophecies, though they speak about the Messiah, are couched in local predictions that Isaiah was dealing with in his time. Chapter 7, verse 14, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. That's such a familiar prophecy. We'll skip over that because we've dealt with it on a number of occasions. And chapter 8 is the birth of Isaiah's second son. And I'm bringing it up because it's, it's the longest name of anybody in the Bible. The name of Isaiah's second son is Maher Shalal Hashbaz. So once again, parents, if you're looking for unusual Bible names for your children, <laughs> this would be your ticket. Maher Shalal Hajbaz was his name. And it meant to hasten the spoil, speed up the booty or the taking of the, um, the spoil of war that would happen to... Uh, in other words, judgment is coming soon and, and they're going to wipe you guys out. Chapter 9, verse 6, is that famous, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government will be upon his shoulder, etc., etc. Again, we've covered that. Now, I'm, I'm selecting a few of these examples, and I want to sum it up by this statement. Listen to it. It's by John Phillips. One moment, Isaiah's book is black with thunder and darkness of the storm, and the next, the rainbow shines through and he sweeps readers onto the golden age that lies ahead. I think he does a beautiful job explaining what seems like Mr. Toad's wild ride in the book of Isaiah. Messiah's going to be born. I'm going to have a son with a weird name. Then Jesus is going to come. And then you know, he just goes all over the place. And he's giving you that variety. Chapter 11, verse 1 is another beautiful prediction. In the midst of all of the summons of judgment and sin that is given in these 12 chapters, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Ooh, how picturesque. The tree of David, almost totally chopped off, the kings of Judah will come to an end with the captivity. God promises the bloodline is even cursed, some of you will remember. And just when it looks like that tree will never spring back, a little bud will pop up out of that trunk, out of that chopped off stump, a root, and that is Christ. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, personal pronoun, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Again, Isaiah's name means salvation of God, and Isaiah likes to point to God's salvation all throughout this book. Chapters 13 through 23 is the second condemnation. And this is the condemnation of the nations that are around Israel. Nine nations are mentioned. And I have covered these chapters in depth. It took me weeks and months to do so. Uh, but all of them know this. All of these nations are somehow connected with Israel. And usually they are condemned because of how they treated Israel. If they treated Israel poorly, you're going to get punished. If you treat Israel well, you'll be blessed. That's a scriptural principle. So chapter 13, verse 1, the burden against Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. Did you know that next to the city of Jerusalem, the city of Babylon is mentioned more in the Bible than any other city? First mention, Jerusalem. Highest number of hits. Second, Babylon. Second highest number of hits. Chapter 14, judgment against Assyria and Philistia, where the Philistines lived on the coast of Israel. Chapter 16, to the east, Moab. Chapter 17, to the north, Damascus. Chapter 18, way to the south and to the east or west, Ethiopia. Chapter 19, a prophecy or burden against Egypt. Chapter 21, Babylon again is highlighted to be doomed along with Edom. Chapter 23, Tyre, the city of Tyre up in Lebanon. You know, Solomon did say there's nothing new under the sun, right? All these nations around Israel that hassle them, guess what? <laughs> They're still doing it. 
You know, I read about Lebanon here, Tyre, and, and all these judgments because of the way they treated Israel. Just two years ago, they lobbed missile after missile after missile after missile over the border to provoke Israel to a war. There's nothing new under the sun. So here's a question. Why does God allow Isaiah to write all of these chapters against the enemies of Israel? You think, what's the point? Because you and I, when we start reading, we go, I'm tired. I'm done. I get it. Because if you were Jewish, especially if you were in captivity and you thought, it's over, you would read these chapters, and they would give you assurance that your God is in charge and your God has a plan for your nation that he established. That would be very important to you, to read these kind of denunciations. Zechariah, a minor prophet, he writes, Whoever touches Israel touches the apple of God's eye. Now, I want to bring something up. Because if you're an astute reader, especially if you have a penchant for fairness... You're going to ask a very natural question. You're going to go, hold on now. Why would God judge these nations when God predicts himself that God will use these nations to spank his people Israel? Israel sinned. God said, I'm going to bring these nations against you. Then as soon as they come, they go, oh, man, you shouldn't have come against them. Now I'm going to get you. You go, "Uh, I don't get that part. Well, let me give you an example. Let's say I break into your house. Don't worry, it's not in me. I won't do it. But let's say I break into your house. Okay, you see me breaking into your house. You call the police to arrest me and to protect you. While the police are there protecting you by arresting me, they notice that you're growing marijuana in your backyard. And you happen to have the Mona Lisa above your fireplace in your living room that you stole from the Louvre. Well, what's going to happen? Now you're under under arrest. Now you're in trouble. Because though what I did was, is wrong, what you did is also wrong, and there's a level of justice that will be meted out to both parties. That's sort of how all this is working out, if you'll forgive the sort of lame illustration. I hope it helps. Verse, uh, chapter 23. Would you go to chapter 23, verse 1? The burden against Tyre. Now again, Tyre is a little coastal city that at that time was quite large in modern-day Lebanon. Wail, you ships of Tarshish. That's out in the western Mediterranean. In Portugal, the Phoenicians would go back and forth to Tyre. For it is laid waste so that there is no house, no harbor. From the land of Cyprus it is revealed to them. Be still, you inhabitants of the coastland, you merchants of Sidon, whom those who cross the sea have filled. Chapter 23 goes on to predict the fall of Tyre. Okay, guess what? What happened to Tyre? Okay, it was predicted that it it would fall, right? Guess what happened to Tyre? It, It fell. It fell not once. It fell not twice. It fell five times after this was predicted. But it's that fifth time that I just want to tickle your historical imagination with. Because here it predicts it's going to fall. The prophet Ezekiel also predicts it will fall. But listen to this. Listen to this. This is Ezekiel chapter 26 verse 4. God says, I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. Okay, so... Isaiah says, Tyre, you're going down. God says, not only are you going down through Ezekiel the prophet, I'm going to scrape you like the dust, so you have a, like like the clean, making the type of a rock clean. Okay. The fifth time it was taken, it was taken by a very aggressive ruler named Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great's dad was Philip of Macedon. Philip of Macedon had a son that he was worried about named Alexander. Because, you know, he thought, he's not going to really become much. He didn't look like he has much promise. So Philip of Macedon hired a personal tutor by the name of Aristotle to train young Alexander. Alexander was a bookworm, a visionary, not a fighter, until his dad was murdered by the Medes and the Persians. This did something. He snapped inside, and he decided after that, I'm going to take up my father's cause. 
he moves with an army westward very rapidly toward Medo-Persia to avenge his father's death. On the way, he stops at Tyre. He attacks the city of Tyre. He attacks them because he wants supplies from them to continue his journey. They won't give him the supplies. Alexander the Great knows that he can't attack them with a navy because the people who are inhabiting the city of Tyre were Phoenicians and they were known for their military conquests at sea. Okay, I mentioned it was taken five times, right? I'm dealing with the fifth time, right, Alexander the Great. Go back in time, just a moment. Okay, keep this, follow me, go back in time. When the Babylonians, years before, conquered the city of Tyre on the seacoast, The people of Tyre, after the conquest, decided to rebuild their city, not on the coast, but move their entire city to a little island that was there, one half a mile out to sea. So now they're living on a little island with walls around it, protected by their ships, by their fleets. Alexander the Great comes, sees where the city used to be, sees where the people are now living, decides, I'm not going to attack them on this island with ships. So what he does is he takes all of the previously laid ruins and basically, literally, scrapes the city for landfill material and builds a causeway, a jetty, a half a mile out to sea so he can walk with his army after scraping the old ruins clean for landfill and marches out and takes the city. That's how literally that was filled. Now, I'm bringing that up because when you start dealing with prophecy, this is why it's good. This is why it encourages us. Because if if anybody with half a brain reads it, they go, you know what? If God said something was going to happen and it's been fulfilled that accurately, that many times, with the odds stacked like that against it, if that happened so accurately, then all of the things God said would yet happen in the future, I don't need to worry about them. I don't need to think, well, maybe that won't come true. Maybe it's not literal. No, maybe you can just like rest and relax and hang out and trust that God's really in charge. And what he said is going to come to pass. But know this, God himself uses prophecy as his calling card to separate himself between all the other gods of the world and himself, the unique and only true God. Isaiah 46 reveals this beautiful prophecy or word from the Lord. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. Now this takes us to chapters 24 through 27, which if you remember when I gave you the outline, I said was parenthetical. And we call it Isaiah's little apocalypse. Isaiah now does this. He's been writing kind of like this, okay? very local, and then sort of widening out the scope of his prophecies to other nations. Now he goes like this. He goes way, way out, and he predicts something on a global scale. And he speaks about global destruction, the earth, all of the earth being involved. And then after a period of judgment on the earth, a great kingdom age in chapters that follow, chapter 25, 26, etc. So, This fits, I believe, in my theology, in my eschatology. It fits right in there in the book of Revelation, chapters 6 through 20, the day of the Lord, the tribulation period followed by the millennial kingdom. Chapter 24, verse 1, Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface, and scatters abroad its inhabitants. The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth languish. I hope I don't offend anybody about what I'm about to say. But for a while now, the last several years, environmentalists have chosen to speak very definitely about the planet Earth by words like Mother Earth, Mother Nature failing to thank God who's the creator. Remember what Paul says in Romans, they worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. There is a a type of environmental atheism 
that says God is in everything and God is everything and don't hurt Mother Earth because it's really where we're all from. And it's, it's this, it's an alternate worship system. There's even Earth Day where people convene all over the earth to worship their God, the earth, their mother, the progenitor of their life. Well, know this. In the tribulation period, in the tribulation period, God will destroy their God. All of that to say this. If you think we've trashed the earth, and I'll admit, I think we have not been great caretakers of it, but if you think we've ruined it, wait till you see what God does with it. When you read the tribulation period, how God utterly trashes and decimates the earth he made in very drastic, and it causes people to wail and moan because their only hope is taken away. And we start understanding the whole reason for that kind of judgment. Verse 19, chapter 24, the earth is utterly broken down, the earth is split open, the earth is moved exceedingly, the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and be removed like a cottage. The transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall fall and not rise again. One of the things we have learned over the, the last uh, century is that our solar system is not a peaceful place. It's very violent. You look at the surface of the moon, the lunar surface is, is, is pegged and, 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 and it's beat up because of the meteorite activity upon it. You can't, if you, I'll say, if you look at the moon, you can't because it's a waning crescent tonight. But when it gets to bigger, it gets to be like a waxing gibbous in a couple weeks. And you can look through a, a high-powered telescope or a pair of binoculars and you can see those huge craters. And you don't have to even go to the moon. You can just go west out to the Behringer Crater in Arizona. And it shows a violent past on the earth, how that a relatively small meteorite hit planet earth and created this large hole, one mile wide, 570 feet deep. Well, what happens when, in the tribulation period, God starts pelting the earth? What that will be like. In Revelation, it says, Great hail from, fell from heaven. It fell upon men, and each hailstone weighed one talent, 125-pound blocks of ice. That's a hailstorm. Have you ever gone to... A, in an old ice house, remember those 25-pound blocks of ice? Imagine if one fell on you. Now imagine 125 pounds falling, the kind of uh, devastation. You say, why would God stone the world? Well, you know your Bibles. What's the punishment that God gave for blasphemy in the Old Testament? Stoning. These worshipers, these hardened people who worship false gods, God himself in the tribulation period, as highlighted here, just highlighted only by Isaiah, will be destroyed. Chapter 25 to 27 is a, is a welcome shift. It's the kingdom age. It's songs of praise that I believe fit perfectly after the tribulation period. Chapter 6, verse 20. I'm just going to highlight a couple verses. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. Go down to, verse, to chapter 27, verse 6. Those who come... I believe this is going to be the kingdom age. Those who come, he shall cause to take root in Jacob. That's the land of Israel. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. Now today, Israel amazingly is doing this, in part, but just in part. They have taken, since 1948, um, 408,000 cultivatable acres, and now there's over one million acres that are productive. It's the fourth largest producer in the world for citrus fruit, that little tiny speck called the nation of Israel. In the millennium, 
it will be fruitful. And perhaps he's speaking about the fruit of righteousness and peace, or it could be literal as well. Now, third, chapters 28 through 35, is the condemnation. Remember, that's the theme of the first 39 chapters, the condemnation on both Judah and Israel, north and south. Woes and warnings are given. And there are six specific woes that are given to these two nations. Now, whenever you read woe, well, if you're on a horse, what does woe mean? It means stop. And that's the way I like to look whenever I read woe in the Bible. I go, woe, stop. Consider this. And Israel is going down a path, and God says, woe, W-O-E, but it should be like, woe, stop. Don't go down that path. Turn around. Stop. Because if you don't woe and you keep going down, it'll be really woe. And in the, in the Hebrew, by the way, woe is oi. So God sees what they're doing and goes, oi. Verse 1 of chapter 28, woe, oi, to the crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim. That's, that's an e- euphemism for the ten northern tribes, all under that large tribe, Ephraim. Whose glorious beauty is a fading flower which is at the head of the verdant valleys to those who are overcome with wine. Now he warns them not to go down to Egypt to make an alliance with them. And the next several chapters, he goes, look, don't go down and make a, uh, an alliance with, with Egypt thinking that, well, me and Egypt will be best buds because when the Assyrians come, me and Egypt will beat them up. God says, not smart. Why would you trust them and not just trust me? So chapter 30, verse 1, Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel, but not of me, who devise plans, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who walk to go down to Egypt and have not asked my advice to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Okay, here's the short story. Isaiah warns Judah not to mess with Egypt. Don't make an alliance with them. They go, okay, we're going to listen to Isaiah. They stop doing it. They repent. They trust the Lord. The northern tribes of Israel don't listen to Isaiah's woes against them. They make an alliance with Egypt. They are taken captive, 722 B.C. by Assyria. Judah is left alone for a period of time until their sins stack up And in 586 B.C., the Babylonians will take them captive. Verse 15 of chapter 30. For thus says the Lord, The Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. But you would not, he says to the ten northern tribes. In other words, look, your real hope is in a frenzied, move and making an alliance with Egypt. That's not your answer. The real answer is to trust and wait on the Lord for his strength. And I love that verse. I love that verse because as soon as you hear bad news, you're tempted to get really busy, really frenzied, really reactive. And sometimes God would say to you, shh, stop. Stop. Don't think that if I make four phone calls, I'll solve the problem. Just wait. Wait. Trust. And quietness and confidence shall be your strength. And maybe tonight, that's what you need to hear. Come unto me, Jesus said, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Trust in him. Chapter 31, verse 1. Here it is again. Oi, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses who trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong, but who do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. So you get the picture here. The warnings and the woes to the north and the south. Okay. I want to sort of connect two dots. What Israel did in the past... They will again do in the future, unfortunately. Though this is looking at something they're doing now and the immediate predictions will come to pass because they'll go into captivity. In the future and in the future from now, Jesus predicted something very interesting. He said to the Jews, 
I have come in my Father's name, and you did not receive me. Another will come in his own name, him you will receive. And the Bible predicts that there will come a person named, we call him, ill affectionately, the Antichrist or the man of sin, who will make a covenant with the Jews and then break it. And they will trust in this man of sin who will come in his own name and exalt himself above all that is called God, Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians. So what they did in the past, unfortunately, they will do in the future. Chapter 35 is the kingdom age. And most conservative scholars will tell you that. This isn't just a skip idea or a Calvary Chapel idea. Uh, conservative scholars, Dallas Seminary, John MacArthur, all say that these are changes that will take place in the millennium. Chapter 35, verse 1. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the deserts shall rejoice and blossom like a rose. Just think for a minute, looking out here in the great desert southwest and seeing flowers in greenery. You know, when you land, just imagine just rolling hills of thick, green, verdant, water-driven areas. Sounds pretty good? It's going to happen. Now, you, if, you think, if, if you think it's desolate here, you go to Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, that's the desert around Isaiah at the time. It makes, it makes the moon look lush over there. I mean, one time I took a taxi cab ride from Amman, Jordan to Baghdad. It was a 25-hour one-way trip, 25-hour back. Taxi ride, the guy, the taxi driver, was a chain smoker and played Madonna tapes the whole trip. Okay, so imagine me in a taxi with an Arab driver smoking, listening to Madonna, 25 hours, going through this desolate, there's nothing to look at. The only thing that kept me sane on that trip was thinking of the future of that desert, desolate region. One day this is going to blossom like a robe, a, ro a rose. There won't be chain smokers. There won't be Madonna tapes. It's going to be the kingdom age. Verse 5, let's move quickly. The eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, the lame shall leap like a deer, the tongue of the dumb shall sing, the water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Jesus Christ came for three and a half years and healed people. They were blind, they were deaf, some were dead, they were resurrected when Jesus... Three and a half years, ministry of Jesus on earth, we call it the trailer to the movie. It was the preview of coming attractions. It won't just take place in Galilee for three and a half years. It'll take place worldwide during a kingdom age. There's coming a day. And there's going to be no broken homes, no broken hearts, no diseases, no hospitals, no wheelchairs, no funerals, no sadness, and no hell. It'll all be eradicated, and the kingdom age will be that on earth. And now in the minute and a half we have remaining... We take the fourth leg of this 39-chapter block, and that is the condemnation on, what's his name? Sennacherib. Or you wrote Assyria, or you could write Aram, A-R-A-M. That's another ancient name for Assyria, Aram. Sennacherib was the big boy on the block who flexed his muscles and took over the world at that time. Now you'll notice something. In chapter 36 through 39, just look at your pages. Just look at the difference between the Hebrew parallelism in the first 35 chapters and the way it's written in chapter 36, 37. It's written just like a regular prose, isn't it? Not poetry, it's prose. Because we're dealing with history now. And really briefly, look at verse 1 of chapter 36. It came to pass in the 14th year, the king of Hezekiah, that's Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Okay. So Sennacherib comes, sends his field general called the Rab Shake, who comes with a letter and big mouths and an army to Jerusalem and basically says this. Don't trust God. Your God won't save you. All these other 46 cities that we've overcome, they trusted their gods. We wiped them out. Don't think your Yahweh is going to help you at all. Give up. Chapter 37, verse 1. 
So it was, when King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes. I would too. Covered himself with sackcloth. I would too. Went into the house of the Lord. Good move. And the first person he calls for, call in the reverend. Call in Isaiah. Verse 2. He sent Eliakim, who was over his household, Shebna the scribe, the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord God, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon them. They will hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. That will be fulfilled literally. He will turn back, he will be killed, but the army remains in Jerusalem. Verse 36, Then the angel of the Lord went out. This is one angel now. Don't mess with angels. And killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when the people arose early in the morning, there were corpses all dead. So can you picture it? That threat comes against them. Isaiah says, don't worry about it. They mess with God. God will get them. An angel comes, destroys 185,000. Ding dong, the witch is dead. You know, this, they look out the walls of Jerusalem. There's 185,000 dead. So that brings a little more color into the words of Jesus when he said to Peter, Peter, in the Garden of Gethsemane, put away your sword. Don't you know I could call for 12 legions of angels? Well, 12 legions, if one can pull this off, 12 legions, like, wow. Okay. Huh. You've heard of the show Touched by an Angel? This is Punched by an Angel. That's what I would call this. But they were prideful. They were prideful. And pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. Okay, chapter 38, Hezekiah gets sick. He recovers. Chapter 39, he's dumb. That's how we end. He's dumb. Could you skip? I, I know we're done now, but could you explain what you just said by he's dumb? Yeah, this is what he does. King Hezekiah, there's some guys from Babylon coming just to visit. And so he brings them in and says, hey, let me show you how blessed we are. And he shows them all of the treasuries of the temple, all of the treasuries of the kings of Judah, all of the treasuries of Jerusalem, which makes them go back. And in a few years when they get power, they will be back, destroy the city, and take all of those treasuries to Babylon. So condemnation of Judah, condemnation of Judah and Israel, of other nations around them, of Assyria, an interlude with prophecy and eschatology in it. And now, next week, Isaiah will go from condemnation to consolation, from denunciatory literature to conciliatory literature, from Old Testament to New Testament.